Okay, Mark here, and we're going to jump right in real quick, so we have a lot to cover. Tonight's topic is, one of my favorite, is Divine Providence. In this segment, I want to deal with the precious truth of God's providence. You know, we all deal with problems and pain. Now, if you have a flat tire, I would call that a problem, but if you have something like a death in the family, that would be more like pain. But where we mostly live our lives is in the realm of problems. Virtually day in and day out we have problems. Um, a theologian by the name of Burkauer said this, Creation implies providence. Normally, sane people, unlike myself, We'll discuss providence after creation, um, but we're going to make an exception. Um, I'll deal with creation soon. But, However, it is vital to see the connection between God creating and providence. Because he who created the universe and mankind continues to sustain and govern his creation through providence. And in the very beginning of the Bible, it talks about you know, God bara. Well, that word bara for create, um, it's not an idea of staccato creation. It's it, it uh, connotes the, the 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 notion that once he created, there was a continuity of activity after he created. You know, when we look back at, at the history of our nation, I'm astonished at it how much. The founding fathers and and the folks before them, pilgrims, were uh, across the board um, just filled with the notion of of God's providence. They talked about it all the time. The invisible hand of God's providence did this. The you know, God's providence that. It was just you know whether people were individually Christians or not. You can see it in the correspondence between the founding fathers, and um, that was ensconced in, in our culture back in, um, you know, the 1700s, but that a lot has changed since then, that's for sure. The flow of ideas over time has submerged this precious doctrine of God's providence under layers and layers of ignorance and false ideas. In fact, divine providence has been largely denied in our day. What we have today is the notion of the uniformity of cause and effect in a closed system. A closed, I mean that closed to any kind of um, input from outside by by God. What is as Christians, we believe in the uniformity of cause and effect in an open system. That is where God uh, interacts uh, within the. Uh, world that he created. So how can we define providence? My own definition goes this way. God's providence is God's power by which he continually sustains and governs all things that occur in his creation and directs all things to our good and his glory, upholding secondary causes. That. Now there's three components that we can look at here. There's God's sustaining, his governing, as well as the notion of concurrence, which I'll explain. Now, in, the, in our discussion, we're also going to talk about the mystery of providence as well as um, why pray, you know, if God is uh, providentially in control. But let us first note that all that God created, he continues to sustain. Not only is the universe dependent upon God for his, its creation, but for the continuity of his existence. The universe cannot continue to exist of its own power. Only God has a power of being in himself. As it says in Acts 17, it is in him that we live and move and have our being. And you can see this in Colossians 1.17 as well. Divine providence is needed to correct the extremes of deism and pagan pantheism, which both deny the biblical doctrine of providence. Deism asserts that God wound up the world like a big clock 
and now let it, it run on its own in a closed system of uniformity of natural ironclad laws. He's either too big or too into disinterested to get involved with the world. On the other hand, what we find most pervasively in our culture now is pagan pantheism, where God does not sustain and rule the world because he is identical with it. While in deism, God is too far away, in pantheism, God is too close. He's not personal and because there's no distinction between the creator and the creation in paganism. So both deism and paganism deny the precious truth of God's providence. Now, from in the 1700s, the greatest theologians of the, of the day came together and um, drafted three documents, the Westminster Confession of Faith, larger and shorter catechisms. And I want to read from their um, statement on for or ordination. Quote, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordains whatever comes to pass. Yet, so thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. That's a mouthful. That's just something to think about. We'll come about for come back to the idea of um, foreordination um, shortly. Now, I want us to spend a moment just to see, real quickly, I'm going to read 10 areas where God's uh, um, providence extends, okay? I just want you to see how comprehensive his, his uh, providence is. First, it extends over the entire universe. Psalm 103, verse 19, Ephesians 1, 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, have been, pre, been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And all things would mean across the whole universe. Okay, the second object of God's divine providence would be the physical world. Job 37 verses 5 and 10, Matthew 4, 5, 45. By the breath of God, ice is given and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick clouds with moisture. The clouds scatter his lightning. They turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world, whether for correction or for his land or for love. He causes it to happen. So we can talk about proximate causes when it comes to weather and, and nature, but it's God is the ultimate cause. His providence extends to the animal realm, Psalm 104, 21, 28, and Matthew 6, 26. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. His providence extends over the nations, Acts 17, 26, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place. Every country um, that's ever been, the exact boundaries, the time of the beginning and ending. Amazing. Number five, his province extends over our very birth, the course of our life, and our deaths. Psalm 139. Six, his providence extends over the outward successes and failures of life, Psalm 75, 6 through 7. 7. His providence extends over the seemingly accidental or incidental or insignificant things that happen in our life, Proverbs 16, 33 and Matthew 10, 30. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. See, I'm giving all these verses because I want you to check with me um, to see if what I'm saying teaching is biblical. Number eight, his 
uh, his providence extends to especially to the protection of his sons and daughters. And of course, our precious verse, Romans 8, 28 and Psalm 4, 8. It extends to the supplying of our needs, Philippians 4, 19. And finally, his providence extends to the punishment of unbelievers, Psalm 7, 12-13 and 11-6. Now, we talked about how God sustains the universe in his providence, but the main stress of God's providence is on God's government of the universe. Now, as Americans, we're used to every four years or eight years change of government, and we have an allergy for kings in our country. God is our king. He rules his creation with absolute sovereignty and authority. Literally, everything that happens was decreed by God and he governs them. The king rules his creation. The king rules his kingdom. God does not invite us to come to Christ. He commands us to come to Christ. And if we don't, it's an act of treason against the king. Now, I want us to look at the classic text on uh, Providence, which is Romans 8, 28. And we know that to those who love God, all things work together for good. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Um, Tante on Panta Sunirge. The on Panta means all which means all, which means all, all. And I'm not stuttering or whatever. I just want us to see that all really means all. This text is as rich as it is well known. Note, as I said, that it says all things ultimately work together for our good. In a sense, that means all things that happen to you are good. And I mean everything, every second, ultimately. It is important that we note that in and of itself, the thing that happens to you might in and of itself be evil, sad, or unjust. Okay? Consider it in and of itself. See, um... Because we must never call good evil or evil good. But God is so big that he can twist the, um, the cruel actions of cruel people to our good. And the key word is ultimately that God will work all things to our good. You see, the context for this verse, Romans 8.28, is the most extended treatment of the fallen nature of creation. You know, it talks about how it, nature, uh, it groans and so forth. So God's providence, and this is important, his providence extends over a fallen world and all that that entails. All the brokenness, all the sadness, physical, emotional, spiritual, and everything. But God is able to work all these proximate evils for our final benefit. Now, this also means that literally everything that happens to you 24-7 is a God thing. Everything's a God thing that happens to you. We tend to think of, you know, really special extraordinary displays of God's answer to prayer or displays of God's goodness as being God things. But this text tells us that every second of every day is ordained by God, is governed by him, and is a God thing, and is orchestrated by him for our good. That's extraordinary. It really is, and it's so comforting. If someone walks in front of you, if a piece of trash falls down in your kitchen tomorrow morning, if somebody pulls out in front of you in, in, in your car, if you walk past somebody in the gym, if a molecule bounces off of you, that happens because God caused it to happen. 
It was ordained from all eternity and is for your good. We tend to pull out this verse when problems or sorrows come our ways, and, and that's fine, but God is so much bigger. His providence extends to the dropping of a sparrow to the ground, so how much more it extends to every second, every situation, no matter how seemingly incidental. It's ordained by God for our good. Think of all that God has to do in order to deliver on this promise. I know I've said this before, but it, it, it really works. Literally every molecule, every cork, every piece of cosmic dust in the universe has to be providentially guided by God or he can't deliver on this text in Romans 8.28 because it, it won't work together for a good if there's one maverick cork. One maverick molecule could be that one molecule that comes crashing down the atmosphere and destroys God's entire plan for our good. It uh, and unravels the entire tapestry of Romans 8.28 for your life. Think of your life as a master painting, okay? In a Rembrandt, every stroke is important to the big picture of that master painter. We would never think to say to Rembrandt, oh man, I'm in a hurry. It doesn't matter what pigments you put here and there. I'm in a hurry. I'm, I, all I want is, a, is the end product to look really beautiful. So you, you can just throw out random stuff here. I just want the big picture to be lovely. No. In order for the big picture to be lovely, every brush stroke, every pigment stroke must be carefully applied to the canvas. Similarly, we see God's brush strokes extend to every stroke, every situation, everything in our lives, in order to make good on the promise of a lovely picture at the end all working together, ultimately. God is intensely, person, intensely personal in how he deals with us, as opposed to fate or luck. See, all is brought to pass by the invisible hand of providence. Nothing happens by chance, because chance cannot cause a thing. You flip a coin, the chances are 50-50, it'll head, end up heads. But it's, it does, chance does not have any ontological existence. It's nothing. It's just mathematical probabilities. And yet people talk about chance as if it, if it does stuff. stuff. And, but it can't. Luck, can't. luck cannot do a thing. Now, the third aspect. Well, let me back up and just say this, that Perhaps the, 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 the main motif for the Old Testament and the New Testament is the kingdom of God and God reigning as king. And see this in the New Testament as Christ when he sat down next to the Father and his ascension. All right, now the third aspect of providence is what theologians call concurrence. Now folks do balk at this because they either do not like God's sovereignty <clears throat> or they don't realize how God can be the ultimate cause of all things without doing violence to human responsibility or freedom. Now, the idea of, of concurrence refers to the coterminous actions of God and man. That is, the simultaneous actions of God and man. We are creatures with the will of our own. That's obvious. We make things happen. That's obvious. Yet the causal power we exert over life is secondary to God's primary causal power. God's sovereign providence stands over and above our actions. And listen to this carefully, please. God works out his will through the actions of human wills without violating the freedom 
of those human wills. He works his will through our will without violating our freedom. Think of like Cyrus and how he carried out uh, that decree. Or even more, think of the stories of Esther and Ruth, how God is hardly ever, if even mentioned, but you can see profoundly the idea of God's providence, but also concurrence, how two things are going on at the same time, that the whole idea of concurrence, of, of people acting and doing what they have to do, but then God, his his overarching uh, cause of all things that, that happens. Um, you got, you know, Mordecai, uh, how he rose to power, the king couldn't sleep, and, and, and all those things that uh, come together in those stories which show God's amazing providence. But the clearest example, I think, in the Old Testament is Joseph. How he rose to power, that's a big story in itself. But I like to read from... Um, Genesis 45, starting at verse 4. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. Yet God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh. Now, in a, in a secondary sense, did his brothers send him there? Sure, they did. Uh, did they do de did they do evil? Yes. Did they sell did they sell him in bondage? Yes. But what um, Joseph is talking about is that ultimately God was causing um, was working through their work through their wills because God is almighty and we see again God and the idea of concurrence that they were responsible for their evil actions and yet God worked it out for their good you see Romans 8 28 playing out in this situation I want us to look at these another two verses which show that there's not a single second that every human being is not uh, being guided by this divine concurrence. From Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And then from Proverbs 21, 1, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. Now, you're talking about the, the, uh, the most powerful man on the planet. And you're talking about the most in, inaccessible part of the most powerful man on the planet, his heart. But God can turn it whichever way he wants to without doing a violation to his will. But he, that's how powerful his, he is. And the, the picture um, that is being uh, talked about here is that at that time, there was like an irrigation ditch in which, with just a kick of a foot, they could cause the, um, the, the um, door to, to move so that the water either went to the left or the right or straight ahead. And so God is so powerful that without doing violation to the king and his responsibility or his freedom, he then nevertheless can incline the king's heart whichever way he wants to. That's clearly what this text is talking about. It, it says it um, right out. So you again, you have what is known as concurrence. And that sheds light on that issue in Romans 9, which goes back to Exodus and Pharaoh, where you have at one point, Pharaoh, uh, it's saying that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then a few verses later, it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I think this text from Proverbs helps us to understand that. 
God is in control of human hearts. He can incline them um, whichever way he wants to without doing violence to them. Now we saw in, in Acts 2 and Acts 4 the concurrence of the wicked actions of wicked men who accomplish God's foreordained death of Christ. That is, the most wicked action in human history was concurrently guided by God himself, which resulted in the greatest victory. So, you know, we sometimes think of God as absent unless something semi-miraculous is happening, something really incredible, some amazing answer to prayer. But God's providence that we're talking about tonight reminds us that God is always, always close by. Always. And that's where we live, y'all, the vast majority of our lives. And it adds wonderment to the slogging uh, aspects of our life, which, to be honest, is most of our life. We live in a fallen world in which we're all broken. We all get, tend to get tired. We all have our issues and so forth, but it shows that we don't have to wait until the the times where extraordinary things happen. Those are, by their very nature, extraordinary. God, 24-7, every second, moment by moment, is meeting us personally. He is our very environment, and in every situation, he meets us uh, personally. Have you ever had a lovely melody you couldn't get out of your head? But once you hear the lovely melody of God's absolute providence, you'll hear its lovely melody everywhere on every page of God's Word. Um, my last point, second to last point, has to do with the mystery of God's providence. You know, but God's providence can help reveal some things, you know, like the closing and opening of doors of, of opportunity and determining what to do. Uh, it's wise to consider God's providence in your upbringing, your experience, your gifts, your passions, and your circumstances. But in terms of why things happen to us, we're left with Job. <laughs> God never answered his questions, did he? We sometimes see the purpose of the trials in our life in the rear view mirror, sometimes. But we never see them through the front windshield. There is a saying, I don't know, but I do know that God knows. I don't know, but I do know. That God knows. While I was in seminary, I wrote a paper entitled Providence as Mystery versus Revelation. And I contrasted John Calvin's view of providence as mystery versus some folks' view of providence as revelation. And what I mean by that is that they had the tendency to think that they could look at all the circumstances of their lives and of course other people's lives and explain why this, that, and the other was happening, especially bad things. But of course what that leads to is the issue that Job and Jesus both confronted and that is people pontificating regarding folks suffering and, and interpreting them um, that their suffering was due to sin. And Jesus and John 9 and John and Job, we see that that was, um, you know, that's not the case. So, in the main, mis um, providence is a mystery. And especially in a fallen world, we need to grasp that fact that providence is a mystery. And we may know the answer in 10 years, 20 years, and possibly in heaven. Maybe not even then. But we just have to realize that providence 
is mostly a mystery and we should not try to see it as revelation as so many people do in the Christian community. Nothing can touch you that has not first passed through Abba's heart and his omnipotent hand. Nothing can touch you that has not first passed through Abba's omnipotent heart and hand. That'd be a good place to stop, but I want to quickly deal with the issue of providence in prayer. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to do a thorough job with this, but just highlight a couple of things real quickly. Number one, since God knows all things, he, he obviously knows that we, before we even ask, and he tells us, he knows before we even ask, so why should we pray if God's providentially in control of all things? Well, because God wants us to as a good daddy. As a good parent, you want your child. You often know what they need, but you want them to ask. God tells us he contrasts. This is intensely personal prayer is, and he wants us to pray. So the fact that God is, is absolutely sovereign and providential is not an either or. It's our Heavenly Father who is providentially in control, right? It's Abba who's in control. So, and then we think about the fact that very often it's us who uh, benefit the most from prayer. Um, think of that acrostic ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and uh, Supplication. Um God, in a sense, doesn't need our adoration. He is delighted by it. But when we adore God, it's something that is very uplifting to us. And, uh, and confession, good for the soul. Um, so prayer is something that does bring delight to God, yes. Because, again, it's an intensely, intensely personal relationship. But then we get down to the S. That's where the rubber meets the road, the supplication. Why pray to God if he already knows? Does prayer change God's mind? Does it change things? Well, we're told in James 5. The fervent prayer of a righteous man. Avails much. For righteous prayer, uh, uh, righteous person avails much, accomplishes much. We're not only commanded in the scripture, but we are given examples. Um, we're told to, to pray for wisdom, and that if we don't ask for wisdom, we won't get it. Um, and it. it that's how this providence worked out. Again, this is an, an intensely personal relationship with God. And um, pro, um, God's sovereignty, that, that doesn't explain everything about our relationship with him. In fact, that's a, a mystery to him. But the, the, you know, the same God who ordained providence is the same God who ordained the means by which we accomplish um, and uh, let's see my best way that we accomplish His will, um, and that's through through prayer, um, at least in part. God has ordained. That one of the main means by which his providence is accomplished is through the prayers of his of his children. Let me put it that way. And does prayer change God's mind? Absolutely not. Not if we're talking about God's sovereign will. Nothing can change that. That's that was ordained from you know eternity past. Does it change things? Absolutely. If we don't pray for certain things, it, you know, it won't happen. And I'm convinced that when we pray for things, that it will change things. But that's two different questions. 
you know, changing God's mind and changing things. I wish I had more time to go into that, but I think you see the distinction between that. So why pray? God commands it. It's good for us, and it changes things radically. Let's pray. Father, we um, went through that quickly, but we praise you and thank you for your blessed providence. It's a mystery, but it's a sacred mystery that is so comforting to us to know that you govern and sustain us. Everything that happens to us, every second, 24-7 of our days. So we praise you, Lord God, that uh, that truth in Romans 8.28 is literally true. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.